I think we're I think it's fine. Yeah. Extreme. Yeah. Cool. Good. Good to go. Hello, everyone. <laughs> So, this is a, thanks everybody for coming out. This is a Sunday lecture series. Um, um, I am Joe. This is Victoria. We're fellows this semester at Bruce High Quality University. And um, we're super stoked to have William Pahida and Jen McCoy here today. Um, uh, I think we're going to do some kind of iteration of hashtag class or speak on that. And, um, do you want to tell them what hashtag class is? Yeah, well, maybe we can just start off with that. Yeah, I mean, uh, back in 2010, spring 2010, uh, I have a friend, Jen Dahl. Different Jen. Different Jen. Uh, we did a show at Michelin Gallery that was a month long where we just had a new question. It's basically like, has art just become a luxury commodity where access is limited based on class and gender and geography? Uh, and kind of posed that question and then. Um, you know, had a series of discussions and sort of related to performances uh, in the gallery for a month. Uh, we opened the gallery on Sundays and we kept the gallery open two hours later. And um, I don't think we got to any conclusive yes, answer, um, but uh, Ben Davis, who recently wrote a book called 9.5 Theses on Market Class, came and you know, posted his kind of thoughts on artist relationship with class. Um, and it was a big, messy, kind of interesting thing, but there were no formal panels. Uh, we invited people. They were just you know, sat at the table and kind of maybe spoke first a little bit, and then the discussions were just open. Um, and it was an interesting experiment, you know. Um, but, you know, we kind of came uh, a little bit before you know, the U.S. and sort of, these sort of questions about art and money and price. Uh, you know, I think we're all thinking about these things in the art world. Right, and, and post OWS and in response to what um, Jen Dalton and Bill were doing, Jen and I started a little gallery um, in Bushwick called Auxiliary Projects when we were really thinking about what what does it mean to transfer art through a commodity network. You know, how does it promote the ideas of the artist? How do you get more saturation, more interest through the fact that something is transmissible and collectible and really um, 
concrete way. And so we started to approach artists and say, like, look, I love your work, and you know, you make these really beautiful things. Can you make something that you can part with for three hundred dollars or less? Sort of hitting the price of a couple of taxis or maybe a nice dinner out and see if that can be the we ran out of the flight pool. So this space opened last November and done five shows and we're doing a few more coming up in the fall and we're doing a booth at Miami, which I feel like is will be imposters or something at the lemonade stand. But anyway, um, we're trying this out. So so Jen is the action person here. <laughs> it's sort of the connective tissue behind all this. But these discussions really came out of well, what does art really mean to people? Like the middle class say they move to New York because art is interesting and important, but well they put their money where their mouth is. And you know, again the jury's out. I mean, I can tell you all about the finances of this gallery, but this is close to a lemonade stand as you could possibly imagine. Way closer than Jeffrey Dyche. Like, Monday stand is here and Jeffrey Dench is here. We're like, we're here. Um, you know, and really, I have to say, I really don't know. You know, like, I feel like we're sort of breaking even, which in the gallery world, I've heard is like kind of an amazing thing for, you know, a year out. But, um, but viable, I don't know. I'm not certainly making any profit and possibly not a bubble. Um, so, anyway, it's a follow up. definitely brings up something really interesting, though, is that the equating uh, art with it's incredibly high prices. Right, you know, because that is necessary. Yeah, and I mean, if we're here talking about education today and higher education, you know, is the cost of an education should it be exorbitantly higher? Do we also equate like a really good, you know, Ivy League education is something that costs an incredible amount of money versus what like a CUNY school might cost? You know, um, when you're selling art for a low price, do people yeah. take it as seriously? I mean, it's all these kind of questions of perception. Um, but Bill wrote a fantastic sort of. Uh, well, it's the beginning. <laughs> well, I mean, it's the beginning to be fantastic. Um, that lays out a bunch of things. Did you, you want to do yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I figured this is kind of a lecture series to a certain degree, but I'd really like to have a, a, a discussion with everyone. Um, and my intention was not to write seven pages. My intention was to just kind of lay out a couple of things that we might discuss. And then <clears throat> six hours later, um, I sent Jen these notes. So I guess we've heard a little bit. Um, I think I could, I'll try to read this quickly. Um, there's some good statistics so that if you're really thinking, was that true? You know, if there's a little bit of your own sense of stuff that I thought was great. Um, but I mean, I think, you know, I can try to read this. Um, if you have any questions, um, we could sandbox them in this future talk or parking lot or something. And then uh, you can grill me or yell at me. Uh, one of the reasons why I also asked Jen to be here today is that she teaches at Brooklyn College, and she was head of the MFA program. You ran that for a while, right? Yeah, like so she's years. in the system. Uh, I teach high school part time, and uh, so I'm, I'm in a different system. Uh, and I think there's some connected things in here. Uh, I will try to read this <coughs> quite quickly, uh, but hopefully you all understand it. You need to slow down, let me know. Um, the discussion around higher education in art has become a fraught conversation primarily about the cost of college degrees in relation to future income slash employment. The professionalization of the arts has also brought questions of who or what an artist is to the forefront of discussions about the composition of the art world along lines of race, gender, and class. The cost of an art degree is becoming increasingly expensive, posing significant barrier, economic barriers for many people. It is not unrealistic to imagine that many students studying arts are the ones most able to afford what can be seen as a frivolous or extraneous area of study to certain groups of people. Being an artist is a free and open concept in theory. Everyone is an artist. All work that changes, uh, that creates change is created. One does not need a formal education to be an artist. Anything can be art. These are all ideas that we can except in theory, yet are not played out very often in reality. Being an art professor is not a free and open concept in theory or practice. Not everyone who is an artist is an art professor. Oh. We almost did. In most cases, for an artist to become a tenured professor, they must hold a master's of fine arts and already have college-level teaching experience. In some cases, a very few well-known commercially or institutionally recognized artists without an MFA are recorded teaching positions based on recognition. Once we enter the traditional arenas of higher art education, we are no longer talking about being an artist, 
It's a pretty an open concept. Everyone is not noise. All work that creates change is not necessarily creative. And one's formal education comes to define their art. Anything can still be art, but the artist will have to explain how and why it is capital A art within the context of Western art history. Formal degree bearing higher education is not open or egalitarian or democratic or horizontal. Access to these programs are restricted based on academic performance and artistic potential is defined by a portfolio. The top schools and programs have competitive admissions and are often very expensive. At the same time, art degrees offer one of the lowest average incomes, but according to the Bureau of Labor, quote unquote, fine artists actually make more money than social workers. The average mean wage for a fine artist is $54,000 a year. Art degrees in general are not seen as a path toward upward economic mobility in the United States. Currently, only 59% of students who enroll in, four -year degree, uh, in a four-year degree program complete that degree within six years. The numbers are significantly lower for minority students. In 2012, only 21% of blacks had a bachelor degree or higher. And uh, in the statistics, black is the category. Um, so we'll find it. In 2009, arts and humanities degrees accounted for 22% of black bachelor's degrees. This data might suggest why the professionalized MFA class of visual artists is overwhelmingly white. The reasons for such low numbers of degree-bearing blacks in the art world may not be cultural, but an outcome of wealth distribution in the United States. In 2012, black households had the lowest median income of any race in the U.S. at $33,000. The world of higher education itself in many ways reflects the economic inequality of American life. The professionalized sphere of visual arts is also a reflection of the economic inequality that is often made visible through racial and gender imbalances endemic in education, commercial gallery system, arts institutions. While women account for more than half of all arts-related degree programs, in 2006, they accounted for less than a quarter of solo shows in Chelsea. I bring up this data to support the anecdotal observations that the professionalized sphere of visual arts is often overwhelmingly white and too often dominated by men. A recent analysis of the Christie's poster auction showed that women accounted for 5% the $330 million sale. While these numbers are slowly changing, there's still an incredible gap between the prices for male and female artists. Of the most expensive post-war artists, there are simply no black artists represented on this particular Christie's list. Despite the success of black artists like Basquiat, who seem to hold a particular place in the art world to always be occupied by a rising, fast-selling minority painter. The slot is currently held by Oscar Murillo, according to the arts media. Murillo's individual success in the professionalized sphere of visual arts, along with the other high-profile Hispanic and minority artists, seems to be used to demonstrate the possibility of diversity in the art world in the absence of actual diversity. Murillo's economic success is rather unlikely. His individual paintings now sell in the primary market for about twice the median income of trying artists. This is what I call like, the golden carrot professionalized sphere of visual arts. A vast possible income, not so different than winning a lottery jackpot. It is possible, although very unlikely for the majority of artists will struggle to earn $50,000 a year. It is notable, though, that the Department of Labor statistics about quote-unquote fine artists do not include self-employed artists. So I'm not entirely sure who they are counting or where these fine artists work. It would seem in my experience that most MFA class artists I know earn their income from other arts related employment like teaching. In 2012, art, music, and drama teachers in the post-secondary field accounted for 92,570 jobs. The NEA recently reported that there are 2.1 million artists working in the U.S., which would suggest that teaching might be able to employ significantly less than 4% of visual artists. This unscientific percentage is only important to partially substantiate the notion that higher education in the arts is a Ponzi scheme. Artists often feel compelled to invest in an MFA, which is used, which used to be a terminal degree, in order to be able to pursue a teaching opportunity where MFAs are considered a requirement. As PhD programs in visual arts emerge, it is often suggested that it is a way to create new employment opportunities for artists. While also, while also expanding the pool of potential students or customers for the education industry. 
In short, there are not nearly as many jobs in post-secondary <coughs> education as there are candidates, creating a very competitive field where artists can be exploited it is low paid adjuncts without benefits or security. In response to many of these dismal facts and figures about higher education in general and in the arts, there's been a growing backlash to the culture of professionalization, particularly around the rising cost of higher education and the attendant debt. This has forced many artists and students to reconsider the purpose of higher education in the arts. Professionalized art degree programs in the United States follow rather rigid and traditional curriculums rooted in modern art, whose beginnings are often cited in the French art academies. It's worth distinguishing here between formalized art programs, which have a much longer tradition, and the more recent professionalization of the arts. It would seem that the latter is about employment and earning, earning and living as an artist, as opposed to simply being trained as an artist. Formalized art education also repeats the notion of art as an open and free concept. Within art programs, there is a Western historical narrative of art in which artistic training is contextualized. The format is usually very similar and follows a familiar tra trajectory beginning with the application process. First, the student submits a portfolio of 10 to 15 works that demonstrate imaginative and observational art skills, uh, including self portraits, abstraction, life drawing. Students who are accepted to art programs then often take a year of foundation in visual arts training, including 2D, 3D drawing, and art history, along with general curriculum requirements like writing and language. After the first year, the student chooses a major area of concentration, including painting, sculpture, printmaking, and so on. The students are pushed to dispense with early notions of personal style and progress through the periods of Western art history towards a kind of personal autonomy within an accepted artistic tradition. The programs push students away from assignment, genre, and medium based work towards developing an individual practice with self generated artistic challenges to be solved within the studio. The primary method of feedback include individual group critiques with professors and their peers rooted in class readings of art theory and criticism that often begin with Tolstoy and end the undergraduate level with postmodern authors of arts and concepts such as the death of the author. The two-year MFA program generally assumes a degree of autonomy for the artist while adding a longer reading list of art theory and criticism to introduce a deeper understanding of the development of modernism with Kant, moving into theory inspired by continental philosophy, feminism, post-colonial studies, and the most recent developments like relational aesthetics, social practice, and technology. After two years, the artist is expected to produce a body of work for a thesis show and then go out into the world and maintain practice in a few commonly accepted ways, show commercially, follow the residency track, or pursue grants. There isn't much variation to the general expectation of exhibition, whatever form that may take. 2013, that may be on the internet, the gallery, an art fair, with a housing project, or a museum. So this brief and somewhat cursory examination summary of traditional, uh, traditional formalized visual arts education is meant to simply highlight the ways in which art is not exactly a free and open concept where anyone or anything can develop. We understand collectively a particular Western orientation of art around the development of the individual artist that fits within accepted categories and received ideas of what can be art. Through major paradigm shifts from Dabi to Duchamp to Bakunin to Warhol to Abramovich and Jay Z. Within a rather narrow set of boundaries, the artist is still challenged to innovate and create something new that will potentially cause a new paradigm shift of what can be considered art by Gaming Soup. Again, suggesting that not everything is art, since there is something, again, suggesting that not everything is art, since there is something that may not yet be known. This runs counter to the opposing truism, it's all been done before. It's worth pausing here for a moment to differentiate between two philosophical views of the world. One resides partially in the metaphysics of Hegel, who in like a vague understanding sees humanity progressing through time towards some kind of perfection. This philosophy, as I understand it, assumes that there's some external knowledge outside of human agency. The other resides in the somewhat brutal materialism of Nietzsche, where progress is not linear, but circular within each generation of humanity, rising or falling, according to its own understanding of itself. Progress is some kind of basic self-improvement for humanity is not guaranteed. I tend to think of the regressive period of theological dominance in Europe during the medieval period and the progressive period of the Renaissance as the dialectic. I don't even know what a dialectic is anymore, but this seems like it. So I tend to view education with the transmission of knowledge from one generation to the next as being incredibly important we consider ourselves the only producers of knowledge with no other non-human agency at work in some metaphysical realm. The transmission of knowledge is not only circular, but we are the very real itself. 
So we must constantly rebuild the world through language, writing, art, science, law, and so on to ensure that we might possibly improve the material conditions in which we briefly exist in this continuum. It would follow that access to higher education is also incredibly important to participating in this constant construction of knowledge in the societies that this knowledge produces. To be excluded from the process is to be subject to others who are able to transmit the knowledge that shapes our perception of reality. And so those dismal statistics and figures come back as a central systemic problem in the way in which our society functions. The professionalized sphere of visual arts is only one area of culture where the restriction of access and participation in the reconstruction or construction of knowledge through education is expressed. In the class perspective, the social fabric of America is often constructed by the privilege, although we like to believe that it is based in part, at least, on merit. I still believe in part that it is the smartest people who get in on Yale and Harvard, the George Bushes of the world notwithstanding. Unfortunately, when confronted with the data about degree completion rates, it becomes impossible to ignore a systemic failure to include greater numbers of the poor and minorities in the process. This may go all the way back to the question that many artists and students are now asking themselves. What is the purpose of higher education? We're investing thousands of dollars in BFA, MFA, and possibly PhD degrees. On one hand, the degrees can be seen as ways of accessing established art world opportunities, professorship, gallery representation, museum shows, grants. A job I'm currently applying for expects an MFA in college level teaching experience. I've been pinning my hopes on my experience as a visiting artist in, at MFA programs to fill this gap. The degrees, though, here are primarily credentials to be used for economic purposes, make money, or living, or just survive. These are generally good things in a healthy society, but they are being done in a deeply imbalanced society and begin to look very problematic when we see who is able to earn these credentials. On the other hand, the pursuit of education itself is critical if one wants to participate in the shaping of society. I think this was well understood by Peter Cooper, who created the Cooper Union to provide opportunities for free education based on merit, and not necessarily privilege. I think it is well understood by the Bruce Equality Foundation, which set up this free university, which offers education in the absence of credentials or accreditation themselves. This is about the exchange of ideas, the transmission of knowledge, and the potential of creating a paradigm for education that falls outside the formal boundaries of what we all have. We know things have been done before and will have to be done again, but we also know that things can be done differently and creatively. This model, rooted in developing not only the individual, but a community of individuals, is closer to that theoretical idea that art is an open and free concept, that anyone can be an artist, and that anything, including the process of education itself, can be art. I don't believe that we should devalue the importance of education in its best, most important sense. The ability for people to participate in the world because it has become overly formalized or professionalized or just too costly. These are problems that some of us have created for everyone else and that it is our shared responsibility for trying to change these institutionalized systems. It's why it's so disheartening and deeply frustrating to see one of the only symbols of free higher education in New York dismantled by people who don't quite understand the principles Peter Cooper set forth that the students of Cooper Union continue to fight. It's also why it's disheartening to see Occupy Wall Street fade into obscurity and the economic debate in this country hijacked by people who have little interest in free public education at any stage for all Americans regardless of race or income. When I think student groups like Strike Debt working to raise awareness of the problems of student debt and the rising cost of higher education, I also worry that it implicitly suggests that education itself is no longer worth pursuing. I hear my own students, who are mostly poor minorities, say that, the college, that college is just too expensive and not worth the money. This is a terrible thing to hear, that an economic barrier is going to cut them off from the opportunity of an education, however problematic the existing models may be. Their assessment that the cost is no longer worth the process of education only reinforces their lack of representation <coughs> and agency perpetuating the dismal statistics around college degree completion rates. Wherever this discussion goes today, whether it's about privatization or how capitalism and the art market are influencing what is taught or how it is taught, I think it is vitally important to remember why all of you are here today at a free university to continue your own education. 
I know college is expensive. I know the art world is too white and too male. I know Josh and Ed Baruka is an incompetent asshole. I know income inequality is a huge problem. And I know we live and work with a capitalist, imperialist state dominated, dominated by a wealthy ruling class. NYU is not so far away. Despite all these systemic social problems, education beyond a high school degree is crucial to change the world. The communist George Lukács fought with the Communist Party because he realized that education was the party's responsibility. And that the working class would not suddenly and logically derive of revolutionary class consciousness. Lukács realized that the working class might precisely do the opposite and identify with the ruling class interests, and that one purpose of education was to try and reveal the false consciousness held by the working class. The resistance to education and critical thought in America, precisely by those with the least education and opportunities to think critically about their own interests, is an expression of a contemporary false consciousness. The terms have greatly changed since the conscious time, but the ideas remain the same. Consensus and democracy don't really stand much of a chance in this country, and a large percentage of people have internalized the beliefs of the ruling class. I'm talking about four white Republicans as much as I'm talking about my own students, we don't often see the importance of education past getting a job. So I'm going to end on the uncomfortable notion that comes up when an educated white person starts talking about helping poor brown people or any top-down model that suggests saving people. That sounds like imperialism or elitism, but I'll end this mansplation with a comment in Rick Lowe, a black man who sat on stage at the Creative Time Summit Friday with a very white native Thompson, made about this discomfort. Lowe worked on Project Row Houses for many years and came to the conclusion that it's easy to talk about place, but it's hard to get to the people. He wondered how loud, how anyone, including himself, can access communities. When he talked about race, he said it's not just about brown people, but about white people. He said that certainly while race is an issue, the problems we face are fundamentally about class. While Rick was talking about the limitations of art to affect change in the problem of housing, his thoughts remained relevant to any form of activism, including education. So I don't know how I got to this point exactly, but I think it has to do with the fact that I really don't want to spend the afternoon talking about an art market that cannot structurally support everyone who gets a degree, or that professionalized art education resembles a Ponzi school. I'd like to open the, uh, the discussion up to the ways in which we might start thinking about how to change the fundamental imbalances in higher education in general. The sphere of visual arts is not separate from the broader problems of access to higher education in the US. I think this is a question that requires us to talk about things outside the interests of the MFA class in the sphere of visual art, of which Jen and I are very much a part. So that is uh, my little lecture, um, <laughs> which I don't lecture very often. So at this point, um, we can open it up for questions or debate. And, well, um, I don't know, this could be a simple observation, but I did have a friend who went through it, which is that the MFA program in this country burgeoned during the Vietnam War. And that was to keep young men from being drafted. And, uh, and actually, there were a couple guys who were real fun guys. That's how they avoided you know, getting shipped off. And so, I think what happened was, you know, there's a combination of really wealthy state schools at the time compared to now. And, you know, and then fairly liberal administrations you know, who wanted to save as many people as men. And then so it, it just sort of took off. And I think, I don't, I think. It, it, it sort of became inflated, and I think sometimes people think nobody's known quite how to respond. There hasn't been a scaling back. I think that's true. I was on um, in an audience once, and Carolee Schneeman was there, and she was like, oh, this is our generation. We started these MFA yeah. programs um, as a way, you know, because everyone was like, yeah, I'd love to teach what I've been working on. This is all new shit, you know. Um, and you know, and it was proposed in the recent, I guess, essay by um, the people last guy, Antoine Bernicle, that art is not a profession. And he argues that, you know, for many reasons, it's not a considered a profession. So one of my questions to Bill, just to play devil's advocate, was like, is it possible that we've credentialed something that wasn't actually 
a professional thing, you know, that, you know, and then we sort of expect them to be compensated as professionals, as if we're all, all like really good air conditioning repair all the time. And I wonder if there's a horse and cart sort of, you know, that's ontology. Use that logic well, that's true too, but if you're a poetry major or philosophy, yeah. there is not that expectation. It yeah. is just supposed to be a free space of thinking that feeds into an academic empire, you know, an academic thing. You're getting a PhD in philosophy. The goal is to get one of these academic jobs where I feel that art has always been sort of an uncomfortable fit, at least in my department. Well, it's very uncomfortable. I think it's also a philosophy. Because before World War II, there was really no art school in America. There was like vocational arts, like SBA, where you learned how to be an illustrator. Right. And then if you went somewhere like Dartmouth or Williams, you studied art history and had a handful of studio art. Yeah. Or you see people like Rosenquist and sign painting or Rauch yeah. or coming with the WPA and like, oh, yeah. I'm make something. And now it's, you know, or even the radio people who became Hollywood actors because they had radio school through the WPA. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, like it's interesting. A, it's interesting to, to consider whether MA is more, an MA versus a longer, mm -hmm. is more of a, is less, I should say, of a job track kind of thing than MFA. But what's interesting, what, this Vietnam thing I had never thought of before, but in an art curriculum, it used to be that in the studio art curriculum, say, traditional drawing or painting or light, that usual art practice, you know, it was women that men didn't take these classes until a certain period. So there was also a, a, a gender association with it until recently. That's one point, and a totally different point. Whenever it started in the 70s, perhaps, the late 60s, there's been a real glut of, there's been a proliferation of MFA programs in the past decade. I would say that much more so than when it first started. So it's become, yeah. it's become sort of a, uh, it's metastasized into something that probably, probably the originators of it in the 70s had not considered. Yeah. And to me, what's more important than when it started as a way to get out of going to NAM is the fact that it's become this job oriented. This, you know, it's a it's a it's a job track credential. To have. No, let me finish because I'm almost there. I thought I was almost there. Um, the MFA idea now there's such a glut of people entering, shall we call it the job market? I mean, whatever it is, it's so expensive that there has to be some kind of fulfillment. You know, you spend so much time and so much money getting this thing, call it a credential or not. And it's a glut recently, in the past decade, I would say, where well, all these people are coming out. This is the glut, the outside of the or inside. This is the glut. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a glut because people are coming out and they have to find a place to pay back the expense. And yeah, yeah. they could be working at a gallery, they could be working at an institution, they could actually be a fine artist making a career and selling work. But it's this glut mm -hmm. that, that's really the disease that, that I think we're talking about. Not the origin. Right. I, okay. I don't know if it's even the glut that's the disease as much as the cost of education. I mean, you shouldn't be paying like the, the amount that somebody's paying for like a you know like a, uh, to be like a medical doctor. You know, when you get out of that in architecture school, you can actually make money. There's some bad advising going on. Well, the yeah, yeah, yeah. degree costs the same for most institutions. You know, if you get an MFA, it's going to cost the same as a you know, master's degree in another field. But what institution? The business model is really interesting. On the one hand, uh, looking at masters and other types of so professional degrees, uh, most things, most things have had to actually sustain themselves. If you go to law school, then there's an expectation. And I think this the industry is really interesting how quickly it developed that coming from GI Bill in the 70s, when you introduce men into the idea of what arts education is, and suddenly becomes a business that we can create a lot of wealth by producing these kinds of degrees. Uh, all of a sudden, they figured out this kind of amazing trick where they said, 
we can give people degrees that aren't worth anything. Mm -hmm. Like they'll pay the money that they don't have, that they'll never be able to pay back because they're kids and they're not thinking about the long term. Like they just assume that it follows the model of every other kind of education out there. Or their parents will. Well, yeah. And then I think the other thing is it's a hangover from the baby boom where everything, all of a sudden, the generations for schools just plummeted and schools shrank. And so they had to fill up at whatever cost in order to maintain these institutions. But there's also a feedback mode because once you've spent this time and money getting your MFA, and I don't have one, by the way, so I'm not speaking from personal experience, but once you go through this process, there's a sort of professional agenda or posture that you have to maintain because otherwise, what? why did you do it? So in terms of feeding back into the system, people almost like have to create jobs for themselves. That's why there are so many people who are involved in arts marketing, arts administration. That's why a lot of institutions are so full of just new kinds of jobs and new kinds of jargon to support those jobs because it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you went to the trouble of getting this degree, then you have to find a place that's totally justified. Mm -hmm. So justified by jargon or justified by structure. So it feeds back into that loop where, I think you see what I'm saying, there's a loop of the MFA industry and that feeds back from its graduates further. It gets, it's a ball going down the hill. And it, catches more into itself. It's true, but I wonder who, who the MFA has caught. I mean, I think previously the English degree was a catch-all for people who ended up in various kinds of industries that were not English. So it could be what that history? just if you had a little bit more maker sort of volition, that you're sort of in that catch-all where the MFA or the MFA or the MFA art is kind of, um, you know, just a stand-in for I have education. It goes to the back to the interesting statistical point. Uh, what are these self? There's no self-employed artists in that. And yeah, the, the, the Department of Labor statistic, they don't count self-employed people. So you have to wonder where that fifty-five thousand dollar figure comes from. Is it are people working as fabricators or scenic shops? And um, there's a couple of different categories, but the one that says fine artists, including illustrators, painters, and sculptors. Um, you know, the numbers are. The amount of people in New York who have been identified are pretty low relatively, and uh, you know, they make a little bit more than social workers, but it's um, about $50,000 a year. So again, I just don't know, are they actually surveying? Well, that's a weird thing, because if you said, like, OK, if you're filling out a form and it says, what do you do for a living? Mm -hmm. And you know, I like if I wrote teacher. down college professor, then they don't know that you're a fine artist right. on, on the side, or whatever mm -hmm. it is you are. So I don't. I mean, it's it's really interesting lost. to actually lost. see some kind of statistic around uh, what do people within that base do. Yeah, I mean, That's a better what, question. how do you earn the majority of your income? I mean, just a uh, show of hands, how many people in here have an MFA today? Wow. I mean, actually, <laughs> this is not your uh, good sample here. Uh, <laughs> how many people have a BFA of some kind? Okay. Uh, how many people are, is anyone here a full-time artist who earns their living off the sale of their fine art? Two. Two. So two out of... Is anyone completely uneducated, autodidact? Anybody? Yeah, does anyone else not attend? You stay out of the system? Does anyone only have a, a high school degree? I only have a BA. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on where you want, I guess. How are little letters? College drop -out. Okay. I mean, the other thing that I want to talk about today, though, and part of this what I had to do with statistics, and I've just been dealing with this a little bit around the other issue of housing, is just, I mean, we're pretty much all way through. I mean, there's, what's your background? Yeah. You're Mexican. You're Mexican. So we, there's Mexican and then a bunch of white people. Um, and, I just, you know, part of the reason why I was looking at degree completion rates is because there's, you know, the art world, if, it, if we are saying it's become increasingly professionalized and you need to get these credentials to kind of participate in the, you know, ever increasing amount of selectivity that goes into it, um, there's just not as many uh, blacks and uh, Hispanics 
getting DFAs, getting MFAs, and so we're kind of excluding a huge section of the population uh, based on this kind of professionalization. And, and we're leaps and bounds now from what it used to be, let's face it. I mean, there are so many artists of color now who are being recognized and they're and who are the MFA track. Rashid Johnson. I mean, there are just so many. Well, that's why I pointed out Oscar Murillo, because there certainly are people that kind of fit these boxes of like, you know, yes, yeah, so we have Rashid Johnson and Lee Thomas. I mean, but if we looked at the vast numbers of artists, the percentages are still very low for, you know, the sales. Undoubtedly, but much more than the it, original paradigm. It, it, you know, even if we step out of the sphere of the art world, where we do like to celebrate like one of every kind of thing that's out there, um, th th that degree completion rate doesn't go away. It's like you know, 33% for African Americans. So what, you know, is when we think Could of the it art world, that they wised up and changed majors. Well, no, <laughs> but within, even within that 30. Percent only like 20% of those degrees that are gotten have anything to do with arts and humanities. So you have of you know African Americans who are going to college completing degrees, they're not studying art, and partly because they're really you know there isn't a lot of income potential. So you have to wonder, well, what drives it? Just kind of like we don't have any timeline. We don't know what's down the road and what the art is. Is there also decreasing arts funding? Uh, yeah, at lower levels in public schools now. Oh, absolutely. So the people go to get a better start even if they have more. And then the other thing is a lot of it began with Reagan um, when they rolled back the telegrams as a way to encourage people to join the army because they were trying to trying to cut off their options. And, and of course, unfortunately. You know, if you don't have any choice, nobody wants to join the army. So, you know, the people who do join the army are often the artists because everything is, all the other opportunities can come off. You know, I mean, I, Jen and I can both speak to that. I mean, when I was in uh, high school, I didn't know where I would get accepted to school and if I would be able to afford it. So I went to the recruiter, took the armed services vocational aptitude battery test. They were like, we'd love you to study language and uh, come and learn how to, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the hell they're doing really for, but. And that's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I <laughs> turned out I got enough finance. I could see it. Uh, this was $36,000 worth of debt to go to Syracuse. And so, but the <coughs> military was like the second plan B. I was looking for an art degree within the military and ended up writing my state senator to see if he'd sponsor a naval architecture program at, uh, the, what is it, at the Annapolis. <laughs> anyway, it was not very close to architecture, but it was as close as the military could offer. I remember a, a Navy recruiter telling that they're all in the books. Exactly. You know? <laughs> like, of course, we have But actually, you know, it wasn't so far fetched. I mean, I really just did not want to be in debt for school and, you know, really angled. Washington Square and you take a box, they'll put them on a plane and they have that access to the very best, I would say, of the NYU faculty and people coming from all over the world um, to sort of think tank this idea and jumpstart Abu Dhabi's like, you know, fledgling reputation as sort of a research center. And so it's a, it's a big experiment, but that's why people go, is because it's free. You know? So I think that there are some very hard nosed, you know, young people who are really thinking about it. At least thirty a year over there. I understand they also have a, a, a an energy of the Washington Square Arch there. I haven't seen that. Yeah. We were going to give them the original and take the energy for ourselves. An interesting place, you know. With the Louvre and the big mine. We called it the Louvre and I love that being built down the street. Um, 
you know, thinking about, you know, what it, like what you were saying, the expanded, you know, cadre of creative professionals who are around the art world, you know, growing the, that population as well. And, you know, in the Emirates, it's primarily the women who are interested in that and good at that. They're smart and, uh, you know, it's not an unviable kind of situation in a place that has, you know, that kind of money for just institutional art. I think also, I don't know, it's because there's so much money here. No, and and undoubtedly, I mean, there's just an enormous amount of money. Yeah, and it's, um, you know, it's very top-down kind of money. There's not a scene of visual culture there. No. Um, same could apply to like Dallas, Texas, where I was just hey. there a while ago, and, and they have like you know tons of money there. They're always trying to throw money at the arts, but they don't have an arts community that's substantial enough to support. They, you know, like art fair going on there now, and it's just yeah, they they don't have the art fair. Yeah, but, yeah, but they I mean it's just they they figure out how to bring that, but they don't find yeah. any center that's you know that has money. I mean I you know for me the. Uh, Free education is a priority as well. I mean, I went to state schools in the South to you know up through MFA, but what I didn't have access to was like an actual art community and art marketplace right. like New York has or other you know, few more cities. Yeah. Well, I mean, that is one reaction. I had to Bill's writing um, was that you know if you okay, I don't know if I can articulate this well, but say we are all guaranteed say in some sort of utopia, a $400,000 a year job. Let's say we all, because that's really what it takes to live well in the city, right? <laughs> yeah, in my little estimation, my sad salary is because I have given up $380,000 of that to not have to have an office job. Like, I feel like the community that we get through self-facilitating our world is, to me, worth that exchange, you know? And so I kind of agree with it. Did you guys read the David Berg article about how New York is dead? And, you know, maybe Berlin, maybe Detroit, it work. <laughs> and then the great reaction by, what is his name, Serkan, uh, art gallery, uh, I was a, a Turkish, you know, uh, artist who just moved to New York five years ago. You know, he was just saying, like, why, who says that artists need to be middle class? Like, why is this all of a sudden our... Um, aspiration, and I, I like that response. It's like, you know, we, there's some sacrifice, but I also feel like there's a lot that we get back. But yeah, these things are all so tied up. Like, I can't separate the idea of higher education from the fact that if you then, if you look at how who who's getting the MFA degree, and it starts to become overwhelmingly white, and then people with the MFAs move to New York. Move into like parachute into neighborhoods like Bushwick, like you know, the UK via Williamsburg, and you get this white concentrated cluster that is very closed off from the rest of the community. And then we start getting priced out of the studios, and we're like, hey, wait a minute, you know, like oh, we're kind of implicit in this process. But you know, it's it's this this issue that it is still such a very kind of white, you know, it's on this kind of race line, and, I, and that's not separate from class. You know, I don't know. Uh, you know, what kind of privilege allows, like, just, you know, how we keep coming to this one particular problem in some way, that then when we start talking about gentrification issues, it's like, well, look at this very white community and, and, a, and a poor brown community, and are they interested just only in their studios, or are they interested in any other, you know, uh, community, like the schools, the, Hospitals, like what? What else are you going to bring here besides condos and high prices? And tax stores? Yeah, I mean, I'm like, well, why is the art world so white? You know, it's not. You know, and I know that it's a lot. I don't think it's class, though. I just think when they're worried about food, clothing, and shelter. But that seems to me an issue of class. I mean, if you're in the working class, or you're the working, you know, if, you're, if you're coming from the working poor, how could you? You know, you're not necessarily going to get the encouragement to study art. You know, you're going to be encouraged to get a job that's going to pay well and support your family. And so how do you, you know, how do we break that cycle and encourage, or should we even say, you know, like I wouldn't, I, I have a hard time as a, as a public high school teacher telling kids like, wow, you should study SVA or some private school where it's incredibly expensive. I'm like, no, you know, like, you, you know, should advise them to be a scholarship student. So. 
Um, but that only gets you through school. You know, like I teach at a pretty cheap university, which is one way that I can imagine you know, doing what I do. But um, but still, I feel like and my dean is certainly vested in this. She's an art historian. Like she's always sort of pushing, like, well, what other careers can we imagine? You know, how can we expand the circle of what your what your expectations are? Can't just be these two places. Um, and uh, I don't know if any of you have heard about this project that. Um, uh, you know, Kumar Melamed Alex um, Melamed is doing where he's doing a training school for artists where you could learn like body shop work and air conditioning repair and it's like a re education Kumar. school. It's Melamed. Melamed Alex, yeah, for, for, you know, for post MFAs who just are not getting where they want to go. Which I think mean, is sort of a, you know, a tongue in cheek thing, but he's very serious about a dog grooming, you know, things that are. <laughs> the thing Well, it was funny, Jeffrey died at a New York show this morning, and he was like, well, artists, you know, used to be able to get jobs doing, you know, construction, and right. doing carpentry, right. hanging sheet rock, but they didn't have to have a full-time job. It doesn't work as well for conceptualists. <laughs> then you end up maybe in advertising or something. Well, that's right. actually, materialize on the wall. Yeah, right? But that's an interesting thing with ITP. Like, I think about NYU's interactive telecommunications program, which I've had, you know, friends who have gone through it, and it's always been a very interesting thing because some people who go into it are artists and want to do projects like that, and other people are more entrepreneurial, Lindsay, and yeah. they're all mixed up in a weird way, and I don't understand what that program is. But it one of Lindsay Howard's big justifications for the Paddle auction, where it was like a digital art. She's like, I want my artists that I know not to be working for like Nike and Coca Cola. I want them to be doing art. You know, it's like autonomous. They're not wasting their talents on these commercial projects. And I just think it's interesting, like we're always trying to figure out some way to work less or work, you know, as little as possible or work smarter. But um, whether that makes better art in the end, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I don't know. I, Protection. I mean, I'm still, I just keep coming back to like, you know, so, so many of the problems I'm running up against too are this kind of exclusion or kind of homogeneity of like the MFA class because it starts to become a pejorative term when people are like, oh, you're talking about the MFA or BFA, our world. Is there another one? Yeah, I mean, get the right people in the room, they'll tell you about it. I'm interested in uh, what kind of conversations go on in your classroom talking to high school students, uh, maybe coming from a lower economic background. How do you have a conversation, or what kind of, how do you frame a conversation about a non-instrumental way of thinking about it, what it is to be an artist and to make work? I mean, I feel like in, in, in the best case scenario, my day job, most of it is about just giving kids the opportunity to experience something that they're not going to get at home. Um, that, that I'm saying, look, there's a gallery at home, or there's street art outside, let's go take a tour in Williamsburg. Um, on the occasion, I've had a few students who say, oh, I'm going to try to apply to like, an arts program, and we need to develop a portfolio. Then, you know, we just have a conversation about, well, how much is it going to cost? And my advice would be to get, you know, get the best you can to the cheapest you can, you know, and take advantage of every scholarship. And if you're a young Latino woman, I would check all the boxes and try to apply for as many grants as you can get because there are so few of you applying for these positions. You know, like the art world is looking for you, you know, in some way. Um, but you know, I mean, it's putting it's human to looking for them, or is the is the educational yeah, the education world? I mean, the complex is looking for them. I mean, it's a two-way street. The art world still doesn't seem to be looking for anything other than guys. Uh, that's well, that's gender as well. You know, as part of the statistic, is I mean, it's still mostly Chelsea solo shows are still about seventy percent men. We want to get more than 50% of the MFA degrees at this point. Um, so we're still dealing with sexism and racism and kind of institutionalized uh, problems. And I, you know, I guess as a progressive artist, what, how do you know, is there something that we should be advocating for uh, as a group, you know, in solidarity with? I don't even know where it started anymore. I mean, OWS kind of came. Blew up, and it was like tons of working groups, and everyone was excited again for a minute, and now we're just back to like business as usual, you know. Well, when I moved to New York, I felt like the nonprofits were more in that sector. 
you know, now there's many, there's fewer nonprofits, it seems like, and the shows that are written about in the same way. Really, that seems to be a real alternative for a while because those grants really respond to demographics in a way that it's There's something that um, Jeffrey brought up. Yeah. Is that how I worked for a nonprofit for a while and saw this happening the shift from uh, grants or foundations to everything is sponsored to problems. Right. So everything's out of the line somewhere. They want to control the content, so suddenly they're there are no art experts, suddenly so means that the marketing department is not an artist. Right. Uh, so there are problems with there not being art experts too, because we've suddenly eradicated potential uh, liberation in the academy. What, what? Well, it's fascinating. Like FIT has an art market degree, which just blew my mind the first time I saw it. I was like, wait, you can get a degree in art market? Because, yeah. I mean, they've had that program for a long time. Yeah, but but F FIT is just so plainly called art market. You know, it was like an art market. Yeah, you get a degree in it, you take branding class. I was like, you know, this sounds right. kind of sorry. Yeah. Um, but that's also, I mean, it's it's less about the expertise or the scholarship. It's more about how do we sell you know, this work, um, which is a strange place. And I mean, Jeffrey obviously kind of straddles that those worlds. Um, that mm -hmm. idea that this disco show though blows my mind <laughs> as well because I mean, it, I mean, they talk about diversity, but it is. You know, and whitewash. I mean, the, the, I'm not thinking about multiracial Brooklyn disco. It's Travolta and the dance floor. And, Although Travolta you know, was actually multiracial Brooklyn. Yeah. But no one remembers that it was Sean's favorite. Yeah. yeah. I love I love the question about the last week answer. Yes, well, I have a big one too. So, no, but I just want to say this thing about marketing goes beyond academia. It goes to the institutions for a long time now. For, there was a time when museums had a separate press department. From the marketing department. So if you went to a museum press opening, it was done by the press office. And the marketing office was dealing with a totally different set of issues. And then sometime about maybe 15, 20, maybe 15 years ago, all of a sudden, it was a press slash marketing officer. They became one. This is something I experienced when I was writing film criticism. But then, you know, they would, the idea is that museums, academic institutions, or art institutions were supposed to be beyond that kind of slash attack where you have marketing and press all in one. I'm saying it's not just academia. It's not just the art academy. It's throughout all arts institutions that marketing, like press, is subsumed under marketing. It's a type of marketing. Well, colleges are very you know, different at this point. I mean, a lot of my students get very enticing offers from schools that I've never heard of. And then I look at it, and I'm like, oh my god, it's just, you know, like, they'll guarantee your admission because it's going to cost, you know, $40,000 a year. And kids don't really understand the difference between, uh, you know, they don't understand the degrees of selectivity, or when a school is just some kind of bullshit. Like, I mean, Long Island University is an incredibly expensive school in New York, and a lot of kids apply to it, but it's not ranked on any list anyway. You know, it's just a very expensive private school. They will accept a lot of kids and put them in debt. And I guess that goes back to that conversation with the students. Like, if I, I've literally had the discussion where kids are just like, I'm not going. It's too expensive. I can't take out that kind of money. Like, six thousand dollars to go to CUNY is too much, you know. And that's like a guaranteed admission for the kids or any of the two-year schools. And there have been some programs that are encouraging kids to get, you know, a two-year associate's degree and see if they'll move on. Um, and that's that's recent. Through Obama, um, but you know it's this sort of as a group. You know, uh, I, I mean, it, it's hard to tell a kid like, yeah, you should really pursue that. You know, art degree. You know, and like that, unless it's tied to, uh, you know. Well, I think a hearty dose of realism at the college level would even be good. I have a couple of students who are already, you know, on their way to do a BFA or a BA, and they thought that their job will provide a focus for their career, not the other way around. You know, I have a kid who's working on his portfolio, and I was like, well, what kind of job do you really, really want? Because he does design and graphics and computer stuff as well as art. And he's like, I, I don't know. I thought that my I would get a job, and that would help me define what it is these goals are. Like, that there was some sort of track, that, you know, some piece of paper that I'd be able to hand him. And so, I don't know. I mean, my response has been to just send him to, like literally every single person that I know who works in any kind of art, design, graphic field, 
So he's been doing informational interviews at like all of our friends, like you know, offices. And you know, maybe as working artists, at whatever level you do it, if there's you know, from if you know anyone who works at a college, you know, maybe something to do is just sort of offer like a sort of lecture on how it is you're putting your life together, and just offer more sort of models for students so that you know, even if they want to pursue art, they know that there's practical difficulties, and then there's also a range of solutions. You know, a solutions website. <laughs> I mean, just I think the more people that you meet in New York, the more you see that it's not any one monolithic strategy. It's just no, yeah, I, I don't. Yeah. I don't think that. I also think if you unhook the MFA or BFA from the cost, then it's you know it's like it's a wonderful thing. You get to go and make art for four years. You get to study. You get to grow. You know, and yeah. that's not available to everyone. Not everyone's encouraged to do it. And I don't know if it's you know, because it has become so associated with costs, whether it's Cooper, you know, saying, well, we can't even do it. That was our fucking mission. Like, <laughs> one thing we were supposed to do. Just, this is it. We can't do it. And, you know, seeing how that, that plays out at every level yeah. of higher education, where the costs just keep going up past the inflation, you know, is there any, does the art world have any responsibility back to these institutions? You know, uh, is the market, you know, you know, uh, should it be trying to, you know, like there's no negotiating scholarship for like, you know, those fuckers make so much money, there's no give back. You know, these, I mean, the Rauschenberg Foundation is gearing up to give away tons of money when it's like the arts. Like, but it, it goes back to the fact that these two, as opposed to potentially other degrees, there's a marketplace for the education and a marketplace for work, and they're not really tied to each other in a way that they might be. Other industries will definitely. Well, I think that I mean, if you look at, if you sort of take a long look at education, I mean, education was initially for the powerful to learn how to, um, you know, monastery schools, things like that. Public education in the United States started because people like Henry Ford found out that the guy, that the folks coming in off the farm, didn't, couldn't even read the safety signs, yeah. and they were killing people. So, you know, there is that whole, you know, education has always been sort of bifurcated. There is the, for lack of a better term, vocational education, which Great is work. this, this, you know, economic, you know, is, is very tied to economics. Then there is this sort of understanding the world education, which was very much tied to maintaining an elite and a power structure, which was the why before World War II, it was women, it was the wives of the captains and, and lieutenants of industry who were going to the art schools so that they could learn how to maintain that cultural separation between us and them. This whole idea of an MFA, of art, of art making, being professional, um, is to me a, is is an oxymoron, because to me, I mean, if you again, profession, professor, you know, that is about lawyer, you know, attorneys and accountants, and, you know, that kind of thing, where you know you're you're managing information, that's a profession. Uh, you know, art has been, and I think always will be, very, very much more tied, even in the conceptual realm, will be very much more tied to the making. Well, it's true, but at the same time, you know, one of the most important things in a college class is like the syllabus, like the readings that you're doing. And it's all grounded. In, um, you know, it was at American University, and the kids were like, the projects that they were doing were related to the last text that they read. You know, it's kind of like they were working their way through a series of ideas. In some cases, that progress could have stopped when they left off. And it was like the last thing that I read, I was interested in relational status, and that's what I meant. You know? um, but also, I, the, the market, I mean, just as someone who just left Cooper, 
and seeing the transition there and also watching other friends go through art schools elsewhere in the country is that this market that we're talking about in the professionalization is actually changing the curriculum and it's changing so even just the agency that you have within a school to study what you want and at Cooper it's very much the, the climate is one of okay so now we have these financial issues and the administration is thinking that the way out of that is actually to professionalize and, and to take away the agency that you have as someone just coming in and learning and make, and figuring it out, which I think is ideal. So they're making more sort of trash. You go no, they're they're proposing like maybe we have a design school, MFA. an MFA program. Maybe we just have an MFA program as a way to fund MFA undergrad. program in institutional critique. In so institutional like, critique. I mean, what it's real. Is the MFA program a way to fund the BFA program? Yeah, and, 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 also, and, also to, and also to change, so, I mean, just because I went there and it's, it's a good example, but, you know, you don't, you're not taking technical classes as an art major necessarily, but at other schools where you are paying a lot of money, people expect technical classes. And that's not necessarily, I mean, I, I studied painting at Syracuse and I mean, the only technical stuff I learned is like how to mix routes and glue. Uh, yeah, but I'm I saying that no, it's it's I'm it's true, but now like just you see schools, no matter where you are in the country, like art schools specifically, like increasing the amount of like technical classes. And so by technical, like uh, what are you? Illustrator. Positioning yeah. themselves as design schools. Design schools right. or or it's integrated. Well, what the graphic designers can do. Like, well, you can get the what's, the bigger, what's the bigger thing? If you if you're at a school to learn how to do art, is it a good thing that, as you said, all you learn how to do is make rounds and glue? Uh, I mean, no, but in terms of a very technical, like specific, but that, I think that's you know, the you know that trade. But if, if the culture is towards this, we're actually here to teach you like how to like physically do things, which is important. But it kind of cuts off the whole conversation. About like you know what what are you actually doing here like your your student who yeah, thinks that like, there's going to be a track it's yeah. like if you're there to learn you're there to prepare for a job yeah it goes, it goes back to the thing you bring up in the initial group like we wrote about that initially thinking about it, everyone is an artist if we decouple these two things if there's a thing we can learn as trades and that skill that you can go and acquire technical knowledge and talk a lot we do that. Derive the arts. That's fine. Everyone can pay what it's worth, and it's very simple. And then the other side of it, uh, if it's going to be about ideas, and it should simply be required that everyone has to go to art school. I think a lot going on here. I mean, every uh, well, I mean, having a strong public arts program in primary schools, not the secondary schools, would kind of solve some of that. You know, at least it would build audience. Sure. <laughs> so, I mean, that's I mean, something else that you brought up also came up though is that you know I feel like at, at Cooper there's the there was a kind of mentality and maybe it's the administration that like if you let people go for free they're not going to feel like the pressure to actually find a job or like you know get a it's job the or take care of themselves. It's the inverse. It's like put put we'll charge you or put you in debt and then you're going to go and have to work. Provide an incentive, which I think goes back to like. We'll the culture space. of higher education where like it's actually like no one wants to be doing these things, but I think it's the, the inverse when you're provided opportunity versus incentive. It's like if you're given a wide open kind of playing field to to build on that and like develop your sense of like your, your career or your your interest based on opportunity instead of coercion and okay. you know, debt and like I oh shit I have to get a job now like I have to make it work and there are some people that respond to that there are some people that respond to that. There is a, a question I kind of have about the whole things when if artists you know we we say things like oh there's not enough work or I can't make enough money people are like eh, and idiot you know like that's your problem what did you think what did you expect like and what do you want in society. Giving you things, you're special. Does the world owe you anything? Yeah, does the world owe you anything? Like, how did you not realize that your opportunities are going to be pretty limited? 
Like, I don't know, just as a group to talk about it, I mean, especially when you take a snapshot of, like, say, this group, people are going to be like, wow, those, like, they don't know our stories, but they might say, well, you know, because what are we leaving, we're leaving out? I came to think so, maybe you didn't know, but it seems that capitalism, the economy, and elitism are extremely important concepts that I haven't heard in the last half hour I've been here because it's, it's what I talk about all the time otherwise. <laughs> like, well, but, but in the sense of an MFA is, as this gentleman over here said, it is such a professional and therefore elite um, degree to get, and it's such a privilege. But it doesn't have to be. I'm not saying like, like, in a like Canada, how can you go to these like you know majority state run schools that have like you know three or very low cost education? You can go through and get those degrees and study what you want to study. You don't have to get paid to get a degree. Right. Like, I mean, I think the, the problem is education yeah. reform has got to yeah. happen. The way that healthcare reform is just you know bumblingly happening right now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an odd mix of private. I mean, it's so much. It's about privatization and making things for profit. That I mean, that's Part of the conversation we could have, and if it's tied to your ability to pay for it, it's no wonder why it's very white. And I'm thinking about the commodification. I teach at ICB, I've taught at Pratt, I've got my master's at Hunter, which is very affordable. I understand something. When you went to the school, too. When were you at Hunter? 1996 to 99. Yeah, I was there. I think we were in class. Did you go to Hardy together? No. Did you go to Hardy Yeah. That's all? Yeah. yeah. There's a reason you do it, Paul. This is a network. <laughs> the idea of commodity, which is really what the art film is all about, and I look at capitalism within a very Western framework, which is again about commodity. Everybody's going to buy this and that shit. And that's what we're all looking to satisfy. And that's what the market culture is looking to satisfy is how to sell somebody with more money something and how to create the desire. And so I think that feeds this complicated economic system. I'm not at all believing it, and I think it's really dysfunctional. But I'm not at all sure how we can separate it out without, like, you know, one thing like what you were saying about educating more people younger so that they understand even what the hell we do. Right. Would be a great it's more of an emphasis on well, but also language. not just what we do. Like, look at those weird people doing that weird thing, and how do I understand what they're doing? But how do, how do I see myself being there? You know, how do I see myself doing something that somebody else is going to have to learn about and understand? Even if I teach, you know? even if there's like not much, even if there's not much work, like workplace value for, say, an English degree or a philosophy degree, it doesn't have the stigma that the art degree has because you're trained that there's, you know, that writing is a good skill to have, but visual language, visual culture, is not a skill worth pursuing, even though you can apply it to. As many vocations probably as you can, right? Well, that's really interesting because there is a sense that if you're doing a philosophy and you're a PhD, that there is a rigor that you are going to be responsible to maintain, which has conceivably gone out of the And then, then even finishing a four year degree, any kind of four year degree, it's like, wow, you showed up and you did that for four years. Congratulations. Like, congratulations, you can complete something. So, you know, that's going to separate you from somebody who just doesn't even have that experience of spending four years concentrating on something. I think that it's a shame that one of the values of higher education isn't, you know, we talk about this school has really great professors or a really great name, but I really wish that people talked about the advisory structure within the school in the same way they talk about the professors. I went to that school and they gave me really good advice, they really led me, or they really made me understand why I went there in the first place, or why I chose those classes, or how to get the things that I need. I, I went to NYU and I never was asked why I was there. I wish somebody had asked me, because I, I didn't know that's coming. That's coming. Yeah. Maybe that's Pollyannish, but with Obama talking about where is the value for your dollar in education, I just feel like at my school that we're really thinking about that. It seems like you both as educators take that very much as part of your. But I think there's historical reasons why they didn't do that for a long time. Like, I definitely, the old guard in my department, think of it as a very isolated, you will be here because you are an artist who has a calling. And if we muddy our, you know, sort of discourse with any practical concern for your life, then it's going to just dilute the purity of the, you know, edifice of. 
I'm sure no, certainly. Come up with. Um, and you know, I think that you know, that's just changing through all sorts of pressures that we're discussing today. Yeah, I mean, Jen Dalton always talks about that when she was a crap for her on that day that the professors were just like professional practices. Wow. I mean, yeah. They just laugh. They'd be like, "You're not selling anything." It's a myth. Uh, like, there's like a unicorn artist out there who sells art. Yeah. <laughs> you're not it. So, you know, and that was like the extent of the discussion. So, you know, years later, doing her taxes, Jen's like, I feel like that copy is, I didn't think anyone was here, you know. I know that feeling. You know, it's like I just broke you. I do experimental new media. I, I expected to make no money. I mean, I, my expectations were really low, and they've been exceeded in that. What's the amount of like, the IRS has a, has a, you have to be, like, making a certain amount of money as an artist for a certain number of years to take certain kinds of deduction. time in artist deduction? Yeah. And self employment doesn't have to be an artist. Yeah, yeah. They, should, they should teach that. Right. Yeah. 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 What's that? Yeah. Right. Years. Right. 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 These are the things that you want to be an artist before you. This is what's required. Is kind of crazy. I mean, and I think part of the education of younger students going into the MFA programs could be really crucial and important, even at the MFA level. But that's still kind of like where we are now. And I guess I just, you know, I still come back to that initial problem that, you know, whether it's uh, class or race or just privilege, I mean, Should the art world be any more diverse than it is right now? Is that you know anything that we have the responsibility to think about or try to change? Or I don't know. You know, I just I, it gets a little oh, tiring. Yeah. So I don't know what the hell we're you know, you're you're like. Two more art forms. Many introduction, which is artist commodity. Yeah, I guess I feel guilty because I'm. In this MFA sphere class of art. Well, also live in New York City. Yeah. I mean, you could talk to artists in Aspen or New Mexico somewhere, or, you know, Anchorage, Alaska, and there's a completely different relationship to many of these issues. Yeah. And getting an arts education has meant different things at different times. I mean, in England in the 1950s and 60s, the children of the working class and the lower middle class would go to art schools, hang out, play the car, play guitar, become the Beatles and the Stones. It was like, Incubator for, uh, I mean, and that was a working class, lower middle class incubator. So, if you want to say class, it wasn't the same higher aspiration class that you're now ascribing to the MFA. I mean, it's apples and oranges, I agree. And there was a different structure there where it was free, you know, and there wasn't this huge debt. But what I'm saying is that going to art school now, I think we've identified on the MFA track, is very professional. Very serious, and you know, because you have to decide on that career track because of the expense so early, it doesn't give you time to make mistakes because of that. Or if you do make mistakes, they're really mistakes. I seem to get a different feeling about it historically than before, where it was a class thing, but it wasn't like upper class students would go to art schools, they would go and learn about government because they were going to rule the country. And, uh, and it was the poorer kids who had some manual dexterity who would go to an art slash trade school. Oh. And then, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. No, I made my point. I mean, I, I tend to vary it. Again. Oh, no, there was a dark side of the English um, art school thing, which is that they were trying to keep jobs open for the return tax. You got this war thing. First it was no, no. Dad, and now okay. it, it really did happen. They were really they were so they would send these working class kids who ordinarily would be sent into the workforce to art school so they would uh, clog up the job market. I mean I do you think it's interesting I was, you know, the California schools, their state universities were free and then after appropriating the you know, towards us in the sixties, very quickly they were like, We're gonna start talking charge of wish, you know, like it's no longer for you, know, you guys are supposed to be our managers, and now you're trying to disrupt our state apparatus. So now we'll tie your education to basically debt, and then you'll have to go get a job you know, instead of being political radicals and trying to get subvert the capitalist system. Yeah. Um, what do you guys think about um, 
I'm just thinking about sort of the larger field. I know that Queens College just announced a social practice in that thing uh, last week. And, uh, they did? Yeah, exactly, which is you know, kind of interesting. But I just feel like, um, you know, maybe it's funny that you said that social workers were actually lower paid than, than we are. Because I do feel like, you know, what does it mean that, um, you know, that the social practice is fixing you know, conceivable wrongs in different spheres, taking on the roles of maybe, you know, nonprofit, you know, health or civic government organizations services, in the past, or government services. services. You know, in the sort of classical sort of relational aesthetics text, they talk about, you know, modeling better utopias and, you know, um, filling in, you know, social interstices that are left blank by, you know, capitalist, um, you know, Capitalist oversight. So artist, you know, artist proctored flu shots, for instance. Stuff yeah. like that. Well, <laughs> well, just a statistic is uh, I went to the, uh, you know, Creative Capital is a, a granting organization that has been, um, you know, kind of filling the gaps left over when NEA stopped filling, uh, doing individual grants. And um, in 2003, emerging fields was primarily new media practices. Um, at the retreat this summer, emerging fields was like 90% social practice projects. So now emerging fields is, is meaning things, you know, people who are trying to create disused uh, beehives, you know, in uh, disused housing tracks or fallen fruit guys who are doing all these things about, you know, public fruit falling from trees and really, you know, interesting projects. But I found it really kind of amazing that that grant had completely morphed into something else. That it was that prevalent that they felt that there was a whole category. Well, just curious, the social practice art degree, I mean, does that um, prepare anyone to do actual social work? I don't know. I mean, it would be fascinating if you had these, so like, again, these kind of dual What are the classes in that degree program? I would love well, to see it. Well, yeah. it's funny um, to think about also the kind of, like, the people that started that, that whole world, like, 10 or whatever his name is, the social practice people that are now in their late 60s or mid-60s, in California at least, and they've moved out of the art world and are now kind of professionalizing in different different places, like yeah. being farmers or being actual like, social workers or um, running different organizations or keeping bees, and it, it's that's also shifted out of art, yeah. I think. Well, then what does it gain you? To be an artist, like I was at the. It gains you a lot of access. It gains you a lot of um, social <laughs> currency. Yeah, totally. I was at the the Esther Gates lecture at the New School of New Hampshire yeah. Award, and you know, here he is working in housing projects. Um, that he also lives in, and you know, kind of an incredible lecture. And this woman in the back stood up, and she was about his age or maybe a little older, and she was from Cleveland. She's like, I fixed up a bunch of social of uh, row houses in Cleveland. No one knew how the hell I was. How did you do this? And it was some kind of amazing, like, he basically said luck, which I think was actually the most and honest all answer. It certainly represents a kind of particular box in the art world, and it's currently occupied by the Yes. Right, but that, that box is a new box, I think. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, there's a reason. He's also like a raconteur, right? Like he's exactly. Like a, the personality. A personality. Tell a story. Yeah, he is. And he does like, yeah. Yeah. He but I did love when he said that, you know, it didn't serve me well to be an artist and not know my local housing ordinances. Like he kind of, you know, lawyered up and sort of learned these things. And, and I'm sure whatever social practice you could have would have like a list of things that you have to be in this to do as well. And I hope that the degree has those things. Yeah, and I just, you know, ultimately I hope that, you know, I wish an arts education didn't cost so much money, so that at least if you're going to study something that doesn't, you know, potentially, it's not going to earn you that much income right away, or maybe never, that you're not putting yourself so, into such debt that you have to pay back some other way, that, you know, it would be great if you could be a little bit poorer in this country and not have to pay for your entire way, like everything, you know, or contribute in different ways. I mean, you know, as a artist here, you have to pay for your health care, you have to pay for your education, you have to pay for your housing, and then there's, you know, it doesn't leave a lot of room for somebody who's doing something that doesn't generate a huge amount of money. I like asking Pagosian, I think that'll work. Pagosian well, you know, again, it'd just be a problem. Wouldn't it be great, like, a big brother or little brother or something? <laughs> <laughs> like, every Dan Collin would have, like, a little sister or something. Yeah. 
sister or brother and you need to pay for it. Why not? That's, that's, that's the Republicans' way yeah. to have this like private funding. Yeah. 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 Well, this is not, I mean, it's different, but it's also not unlike this, this idea that Peter Cooper had when he founded the Cooper Union, which is that wealth, great wealth is a public trust. Right. And like that is. And those and guys believe that. That's why we have these ends. Yeah. <laughs> the folks are also great philanthropists. And, you know, just, just to mention that. But they're not on people aren't. Um, people my age aren't. It's not a great philanthropy. They're not on people. It's actually really right shifting. I disagree with you. I think are they, they, they think it's more in love with my wife's in Well, that's, that's yeah. there at the level. No, but, but there's, there's an article in the recent, recent New Yorker about how San Franciscans are really rethinking things and people are making a ton of money with a crazy stupid app or something. And then they're really thinking about social change. And I think it's too early to tell, but there is a shift in the younger people, probably probably 35 and below, mm -hmm. that's starting to recognize multiracial, interdisciplinary, much more global thinking and the importance of giving money back out. I don't know. I'm not actually generalizing. I'm just thinking of people who have gone on record as being not in support of philanthropy. Oh, well, definitely. But, you know, we're only in, like, year four of all of this sort of potentiality. But there's so much wealth being created within the tech sector now that it has to subvert. I mean, what's it going to do if it doesn't attempt to subvert what's been going on for hundreds of years? Bella drones in Brooklyn. I mean, there's lots of big ones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that guy? Yeah, right. That's not happening, but I, I met that guy. Yeah. I also think that you know, art is really it is a public trust thing, and so the problem is that it's not recognized in a way that, let's say, gives artists a subsidy that allows us to do the things that we do, recognizing that it's bringing something to culture that finance does not. I guess the, the problem though is when it comes once we start defining. I, like, I get stuck in this crowd thinking about art as being this MFA class. It, it, you know, why does that professionalized area where artists who pursue this and invest in the money deserve anything? And does if it if it comes from a homogeneous culture of you know white people and it's kind of privileged, you know, does that accurately reflect the rest of society or a public trust? And it, unfortunately, it doesn't. So as a group, we can't really be asking for like this kind of special thing. If we're not representative or inclusive of the public, you know, and different cultures, we may not give a shit about, you know, modernism, mm -hmm. you know, at this point. Well, so then you're at Jeffrey Day, just, you know, with the street art, thinking about other models of art within a large so culture. Certainly, you can bring people into this, you know. The, the but why is it in there or any? Why is that value? I mean, why well, yeah, art is this privilege. Just when you know, we talk about a yeah. kind of MFA class of, of artists or so if we're asking for something, what else should we be asking for for everyone else who's in a similar book? Like we were I was talking with Kathleen Gilray from SmackDown. There was a, there actually was a hearing uh, on keeping New York City affordable for artists in the city council. I guess they do this every two years. But she was going to make the argument that she really only wanted to talk about artist studios because artists do have this weird thing where you need a lot of space for long periods of time. You can't just swap out with a musician. You're in there for a while to practice and move on. Um, but she didn't want to talk about housing because affordable housing in New York affects not just our like, you know, it's a huge issue that, you know, if we're MFA artists, we should be advocating and creating coalitions for affordable housing in general. When we then when we say, hey, by the way, that you know, before that factory gets turned into condos, can we get our hands on it or you know, keep that as artist studios, we don't look like or I don't know, self-serving people. Yeah. No. Well, that's what makes it very difficult to think about art as a vocation. I mean, it's it, because you, in the same way that like being a novelist can be a vocation, a big writer being a novel, because these things pile up in your apartment and things like. Maybe not full time. Well, if you're or you're painting in your apartment or something, you don't have ventilation. Or you're <laughs> working with, you know, like. Well, but you need, you need, like, there's high overhead. And so it's a lot for, it's a lot to not be able to dedicate time to it. And I, and so you kind of have to have either a professional sphere or vocation, more vocational oriented institutions if you're not just going to be trading. 
if you're trying to, I mean, if, if everybody's an artist and we're just trading with our friends, which is great, but then, you know, you need a job and you need a shorter work week. And, and there's not enough jobs generally. It's not like there's well, specifically an art problem. There's fewer jobs, and the ones that are left are shittier. And the jobs that weren't completely useless, that poor people could get and still be okay and be like poor the way you need to be if you're going to be an artist, are just going away. It's like all of the like high level, low level jobs, they're just like disappearing. And so there's just a crisis in employment generally. So when we talk about what are we advocating for, I don't know, shorter work week and a basic guarantee income, but what is that? Yeah, I'm not sure that should be on anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is a frustrating conversation because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of I'm interesting to me because it's like that area that you've knocked out. It's a really broad in scope, but it's also like uh, nothing good can happen no matter what you do. And I don't I, think that's true at all. I, I kind of feel that way. It's like. I feel like we've just been tossing out, like, you know, you push you push in one direction and then you have a, a bad effect over here. And and so it's all related in that way, but I think it's, um, it seems like we keep coming back to, like, the word MSA. And it's kind of unimaginative overall to keep, like, thinking in these terms when I just feel like, there, to me, nothing good will ever happen unless we let a lot of this stuff go as, as almost like mental constraints. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's nice. I just, you know, I, I wish it would go away that easily. You know, like that the job that I was interested in applying for was really only interested in my being in New York for 14 years and writing about art and. You know, making art, and the, the MFA was not a qualification. Like it was really based on the work that I've done. And it's fine. Uh, I do have an MFA, so I'm like, hmm. um, but those 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 structures are still there. And I mean, they're a reality for anyone who's kind of participating in the market now. So how do we get everyone to start thinking about outside of these you know terms and boxes and conditions? Um, because if we do it individually on our own. It might feel good, but I'm not sure how we start to shift that thinking kind of fundamentally. And there's certain forces that don't want any change in that. I mean, the market's like, you know, we've got this, you know, we're making our money, it's working, go away. And not all artists that I know even agree sort of politically on what is worth kind of arguing for or fighting for. And so I think for me, it just kind of comes back to that first question of like, as a group, do we have common interests that we should start articulating and looking for ways to support? So that, because I feel like we are just always like, let's let's all do something together, but separate. You know, like, you know, what were you doing last week? Was you know, what were you you know arguing for? And it's all just kind of separate, and so it just gets swept under the rug or something. You know, we're not able to kind of act as a block of people that share a common interest that need common things. Um, and that, you know, we can hopefully make some friends or support something worthwhile. I, you know, I don't know, because the current conversation does always tend to be like, MFA and prices and what the fuck that it is. The human chains around yeah. our schools to prevent people from observing. <laughs> 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 that's what you're looking into. Yeah, that's what I'm talking Yeah, a little transparency, like we all wear signs. Like, this is how much money it will cost. This is how we will pay. I got the idea. Sorry. I got the idea that Casey meant just let's forget about the art world, forget about the art schools, let's get our alley institutions, and think about what we can do in the 21st century in a completely different way with arts in society or not. Isn't that what you would do? With I mean, that's kind of, yeah, I mean, we're returning to these institutions, we return to the product, a product of those institutions. So as, you know, sort of thinking about it, like, <coughs> thinking about the thing that made me, the major, and, you know, people with MFAs or BFAs, you know, we're in that, we create those systems, we're 
products of them, and it's kind of like to step fully outside of that, you know, it's it's kind of impossible. And I mean, this through Psychology Foundation University comes through the same processes, and you know, it's tied to the art market. It's tied to the ways in which the kind of system works. Um, so it's not kind of going away. You can definitely deal with alternatives, but how much can you farther before you need to pay for rent? You know, I mean, there's Right. Um, but I do think that the market system is becoming so homogenous and uninteresting that yeah, soon like the alternative art world will just emerge. Right. You know, when you have galleries saying, I don't even know if I need a space because no one comes in to see the shows anymore, I sell everything at fairs or online to the same ten people, then, you know, it's a broken system for many mid-level galleries and lower level, forget it. So I just think that its own stultified death is sort of imminent. And so we can only just be great spectators and, uh, you know, do Go something ahead, different. Ahead. Yeah, just <laughs> build, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Another, is that I have a question in general. I've been very involved with the nonprofit called the Camera Collective Organization. And it's been incredibly rewarding, but I'm also very involved in trying to create a community that's more diverse, trying to bring people of color into it. We get grants and we have residencies and things like that. So for me, that's actually a huge part of, or a huge fulfilling of that effort to make change. So I think we are all, as an artist, it's pretty hard to be it's part of the mainstream or constantly, I guess. And the question is, what are we doing for the rest of, the rest of our time? I'm not going to join freelancers. That seems like they don't even think they're health insurance. So you know, what sort of things are out there? You have to search within your own world. You fight against that tendency to be self-isolating or to make you work, only you go out and sort of socialize at openings and hope you can I don't know how many people here are involved in some way, shape, or form with, with some other organization. Well, I mean, right now I'm working with a couple of other artists. It's a very small group. It's not horizontal. Structure the imagination, but the idea is to see if we could potentially buy some property. Whether we try to get our money from rich art people, or we, you know, basically looking for like a big old swing loan to buy some property, um, and then keep it as studios in perpetuity at the rate, that, you know, at cost now and in the future. And it is not easy; it costs a shit ton of money, and, you know, talking millions of dollars. But, you know, I'm watching a friend, you know, sign a 10-year lease on a place and they're going to build it out, pay for a sprinkler system, and in 10 years, there's no guarantee that that would say studio. So it's just, we're kind of constantly engaged in short-term investments that then get you know, linked into these other problems of gentrification where creative time suddenly you have a question, are artists to blame for the gentrification of Williamsburg? <laughs> you know, and it's like, statistically, artists are like about 1% of the population of Williamsburg and work, you know. It's a very, we're actually a very small number in these larger populations, and what causes gentrification, you know, certainly comes after it, and we may be part of it, but we're like a not the fraction of the population. Even if not, the bad, you know, it's like, how did it not be the, the deed, you know, the problem, and, and, and having to move on and, you know, perpetuate that, that particular problem. Um, but, you know, I think with the studio thing, it's, it's, you know, how do we use, like, the tools of capitalism to try to, like, acquire something, become a distributed property owner? And it's not tied to one individual. Like, oh, I've decided that I'm moving and I'm selling for a profit, you know, and I'm going to More blow collective. Up. Yeah. I mean, like, 56 Bogart, which is, like, the kind of little part of Bushwick Open Studios, like, the minute that guy decides uh, I'm selling it, you know, it could become anything. So all those artists in there, it's like, forget it, you're done. So where's their agency? You know, where can we create some agency for ourselves? And uh, Arts and Labor just had an alternative economies uh, thing at Ivy. And we were talking a little bit there. Okay. Yeah, it was just, you know, as, a, as an artist going to that, who's not, not, you know, a radical anarchist, I just felt a little bad because it seemed like it was just, the activists, like, you know, like having, like, a nice afternoon together, and there was no one else there to kind of, like, learn or, you know, find something to advocate for or join up for, design, you know, like, get some numbers going. It was just seemed very insular. 
So I don't know how to, you know, how we deal with that as well. We could call it, it's 545. Yeah, there's another class at 6. So. Okay. What's next? Branch and Rose chat, chat room. Oh, Cool. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah, well, thank you guys for having me. Um, next week is um, this guy, Marcus Meissen, who is an uh, architect. He's doing the Performa Hub this year. And he's, um, he's, um, he's written like a really awesome, he's, he's done a lot of writing on like. Uh, Pseudo democracy of religion was called the right pair of Thank <laughs> you.